Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. It's printed in the bulletin. If you'd like to read along, you can just listen along if you'd like. Let us hear the word. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. It's rained a little this week, just a little. We have felt that rain in so many different ways. The flood can be actually literal for us. It can be metaphorical for us. But in our spirits and in our hearts and in our bodies and in our minds, we have felt the flood. I've experienced a few floods in my life. The first one was when I was about five years old. And I think I've mentioned that my father was the manager of a sirloin stockade in Claremore, Oklahoma. We had some rains, much like what we had this last Wednesday and Thursday, and um, things backed up in the Neymar Center in Claremore, Oklahoma, where the sirloin stockade was located, and we had to work overnight to dry out, get water out. All employees were called in, and all family was in, even the five-year-old. I'm sure that somewhere along the night, I found a booth to take a nap in or something, but we got back to our house just as the sun was coming out. Being five and not really understanding anything about time, I just ran on down to Daryl's house about three houses away when we got home. My parents were exhausted. I'm pretty sure they opened the door and they're just looking around and I was gone. I knocked on the door. I knocked on the door. I rang the doorbell and no one came to answer. Can you believe that 5.30 in the morning no one answered the door? (laughs) I went back to the house, and my dad was like, where were you? And I was like, I just went to see if Daryl could play. And my dad was like, get in the house. (laughs) That was the first flood in my life. The second flood was when I was in seminary. In fact, I hadn't even started classes yet. We were just having orientation. A friend of mine and I from college, there were three of us that were going to live together in seminary. Two of us moved early to try to find jobs to kind of get settled in Indianapolis after graduation. So we were in temporary housing because the house we were going to be moving into was having flooding issues. There were water issues in the basement. And they promised they would get it all fixed. So three of us moving into a two-bedroom condo that was a little tight, we decided that one of us should live in the basement. That's the biggest room in the house. I'll live down there. It was sweet. I had my TV on my dresser, everything. It was beautiful. It was awesome. And um, then a Saturday, the first Saturday of college football, because I was glued to the TV. And it started raining. And it was raining. And it was raining. And I was watching football and napping and watching football. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, it's It's been raining a long time and really hard. So I look out on the street, and there's just water throughout the whole street, up in our yards. And I lay back down and watch a little more football. And then I was like, oh, that's a lot of rain. Maybe I should check the basement. I open the door and take about two steps down. And do you know what I see? A TV floating in the water. (laughs) I run down and I have water to hear. Everything that I have is wet. And I had started working at that point, but I hadn't been paid. And all that graduation money had started to run out. Okay, it had run out. (laughs) I had a friend, my friend Michael. He and I were the ones that moved early. 
we had a great summer that summer. We played a lot of Frisbee golf, created this whole 18. He got a job, though, and it wasn't in a church, so he was actually making a little money. He was working at a blockbuster. He came home from work at 10 o'clock at night. I was completely lost. I didn't know what to do. Every stitch of clothing that I had was wet, and I needed to go to church the next day, and I had no money. $80 may not seem like a lot of money, but it's a lot when you have to convert it to quarters and put it into the laundromat <laughs> machines. And he paid for it all without asking a question. He came home, saw what happened, and said, well, let's go. I can't tell you what that meant to me. I mean, floods are going to come, you know. But it's those people who help out in the midst of those floods. It's our response to those floods which makes all the difference in the world. In our scripture today, Jesus is asked, Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. You've heard me say that the Gospel of John is not necessarily my favorite gospel. It's the last written, and it's written at a time when Jews and Christians are at war. And in this gospel, you heard Jesus say plainly that the Jews who came and asked that question don't get it. You don't get it, you Jews. You don't get it. I have told you plainly. I've done lots of things. I've testified by my works to God. And you don't understand. In our modern day, it doesn't take a lot of jumping from that piece of scripture on the page to hate groups who will discriminate and be mean and seek to do violence on those who might have been mean to Jesus. But it's clear that even the disciples, Jesus' best friends, didn't understand him. So for me, that's part of the reason why the Gospel of John gets me. The people who got Jesus were women. They weren't supposed to get him. Gentiles who have no history of the teaching of the Jewish faith, the Gentiles meaning non-Jews, those are the people who got Jesus. I think it's safe to say that now that we've created a Christian church throughout the world, if Jesus came back today, we Christians may not get him. And we have all the history. People didn't understand him. People still don't understand him today. Wouldn't it be nice to have been the disciples, though? Because for the last few weeks, all we've read about is how Jesus came back to them after the crucifixion and before the resurrection. He came to them. It was a physical presence to them. They're having a difficult moment. They're wondering if they're going to be arrested like he was, if they're going to be crucified like he was. And he comes and he says, oh, peace. And he doesn't just come once, he comes twice, he comes three times, and he says, oh, peace. Peace be with you, now do my work. You're my disciples, I've come to you, go feed my sheep, be my people. Well, we've had a difficult week, and it would sure be nice to have some assurance by appearance, because 9-11 happens, and we go, where are you? Boston happens, and we go, God, where are you? West Texas happens, and we wonder about the presence of God, and the floodwaters rise, and we question. Tell us plainly. Remind us, O oh God, that we're not alone in this world because this week we're feeling alone. Maybe we could even try to handle all these huge issues if we didn't just have to handle the day-to-day -day also. Because the day-to-day -day doesn't go away just when the big stuff comes. 
I shared in my newsletter article about social media this week and how several of my friends on Facebook had talked about Mr. Rogers. I talked about this with the kids at the youth group. They didn't know who Mr. Rogers was. <laughs> Do you know who Mr. Rogers is? No, you don't. That makes me so sad. You do know Big Bird, though, right? OK, then we're good. <laughs> Mr. Rogers used to follow Big Bird when I was a kid, children's TV host. He was a Methodist minister. Many of you probably knew that before he started doing that gig. He asked his mom one time when he was a boy, why do bad things happen? And her response to him was this, don't worry about the bad stuff. Look for the helpers. Because in any bad moment, there will always be people rushing to help. You saw the footage. You saw all the people. The bomb goes off, and instead of running away, they ran too. You heard the stories about fire chief and first responders in West Texas. The explosion happens, and they don't secure a perimeter. They go get people. And we know the stories from 9-11 also. You probably know the stories in your own personal life. You probably have that first responder in your life. When something goes bad and you share that information, they come running to you. That's God. No matter what you may hear from other people, at least in my humble opinion, that's where God is in those moments. God didn't cause people to make explosions. God didn't say, hey, West Texas, we need to shake you up a little bit. But in the moment that anything good comes out of it, that's where God is. Look for the helpers. What great advice. I've been to New Orleans on three mission trips in the three years just after Katrina. The last two were a little easier because we got to really do some work. The first trip was really hard. We were there just 60 days after the hurricane, which in New Orleans proper, it wasn't necessarily the hurricane that got him, it was the floodwaters. When the levees breached, all we did, all we did all week, was pick up wet stuff, walk out the door, and drop it at the curb. Now, if we got all of that out, then we were to cut out the drywall to the studs, take a, sp uh, a spray solution filled with bleach, and kill the mold, and then that's how we left the houses, if we were able to get that far. We worked in one neighborhood for three days. We saw exactly five people in that neighborhood. Five people, everyone was gone. 150,000 people in New Orleans by day, or uh, by night, 300,000 by day. 150,000 people were coming into the city of New Orleans, and you know what they were doing? They were bringing their trucks, they were putting the wet stuff in their trucks and going to the dump and getting paid because that was the only real job and you got paid by the pound. So people drove in, worked, and drove out. There was no construction, no renovation. So we pick up people's wedding pictures. We pick up their clothes. We pick up their books, sometimes their Bibles. It was horrible. We had worked for a whole week. And we came to the last house, a single woman, a two-bedroom house. But she was completely and totally by herself. In that one neighborhood where we only saw five people, someone had the audacity to write on the side of a car that's completely dusted up. God is still here? This woman didn't think so. We came to her house, this mission, this mission crew of about 10 adults from Kansas City. We came to her house, and in a morning, we did what we had done. 
we took everything out of her house and put it on her front yard. She was there with us working. One of the few residents that we worked for that happened to be there. And she broke down. She started to cry. And she said, these last two months have been the hardest months of my life. I had begun to lose my faith. I didn't think anybody cared. But today, you've helped me get my faith back. Floods happen. As the people of God, let us be the helpers. That God may be known in this world. That's our response. And thanks be to God that it is. Amen.